Okay, good morning everyone and can I welcome to the 22nd meeting of 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones or put them to silent mode as they can disrupt our meeting. Uh, can I welcome Gordon Lindhurst uh, this morning who is coming along as the substitute Conservative member uh, in place of Jeremy Balfour who has sent his apologies. Um, so you're more than welcome, Gordon. We move to agenda item one, which is decision to take items in private. And the committee is asked to agree that item four, consideration of evidence, is taken in private. Is the committee agreed to that? Yes. Okay, thank you. We move to agenda item two, social security and work poverty. And agenda item continues our inquiry into that particular topic. And there's our penultimate evidence session, so we're nearly there with a short focused inquiry. And can I welcome Donna Ward, DWP Policy Director, Children, Families and Disadvantage, Pete Serrell, DWP Policy Director, Working Age Benefits, and Denise Horsfall, DWP Universal Credit Area Director, Scotland. Thank you all of you for coming along this morning. You're very welcome and we appreciate your attendance. I know one of you is making a short opening statement, but I'm not actually sure which of you, so who's going to do that? It's me, Donna Ward. Donna, thank yes. you. And you go. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting us. Um, I'd just I'd like to start by saying that we absolutely recognise that in-work poverty has increased. Uh, we now have 3.3 million adults in the UK in in-work poverty, uh, and two-thirds of children in poverty, and I know child poverty is such a big issue for you in Scotland, are now in families that work. So the whole composition of the population in poverty has shifted, uh, and we absolutely recognise that. Uh, and the UK government has done quite a lot of work to try and understand that uh, and uh, to see what we can do about it um, and to check that all of our policies are consistent uh, with helping to improve the situation. So most of this issue is kind of the flip side of a really good labour market. We now have... Three quarters of all adults of working age are now in employment. So that's uh, across the UK, but also in Scotland. We've had a million fewer workless households since 2010. So it's really quite remarkable uh, kind of change in the labour market um, since the financial crisis. Um, and it's, so it's really about that rather than a really big shift in the underlying risk of being in in-work poverty. So the risk of being in in-work poverty has stayed quite flat at around 10% uh, for working people. But I'm not going to sit here and say it's just about that. Of course, it's still much better to be in work. Uh, you're five times less likely to be in poverty as a child if you're in work. Uh, so, of course, uh, that's still much better. Um, and the risk hasn't fundamentally changed of being in poverty if you've been in work. But that's not the case for absolutely everyone. As we said in our written statement, which came in advance, we know that for children uh, in uh, poverty, after housing costs, the risks of being in in-work poverty have increased. So that's partly down to uh, the kind of greater cost of private renting, uh, but it's also uh, to do with uh, some aspects of the labour market. We know from the JRF report, which was really helpful on poverty in Scotland, that the risk of being in in-work poverty has increased for lone parents in Scotland. So there are issues there. Uh, and we've done some extensive analysis about who is in in-work poverty. Uh, so if you take the whole population in in-work poverty, it really breaks down to mostly being those families who are only working part-time, one-earner couples, and then low-earning self-employed people. So there is a small residual element of people where both couples are in full-time work, but actually full-time work within the household virtually eliminates pov um, in-work poverty for both uh, the whole of the UK and for Scotland. So uh, there's definitely something about working patterns and work intensity, and we believe that universal credit um, is really well designed uh, to get people into work in the first place, but then also to smooth their incentives uh, to work more. It's removed uh, a lot of the cliff edges uh, from the old tax credit system, and it's helped uh, if people are worried about uh, fluctuating earnings, or whether if they take a job, will they then lose their job? Are they going to have to navigate between two systems? 
And the incentives under universal credit have improved um, thanks to the recent budget measures. So the increase in the, um, the work allowance, that was the main thing that the JRF um, had recommended as a change to universal credit um, to help tackle in-work poverty. And of course, um, the UK government has been listening. So, of course, um, I know your main interest is in relative poverty. There's lots of different measures of poverty. Um, and relative poverty, um, as you know, uh, is the sum total of everything that happens in the benefit system, the labour market, but then also the wider macroeconomy. So it also obviously matters what happens to the median income line. Um, and we know that um, relative poverty has improved um, after the financial crisis, but that was really because median incomes uh, collapsed. Uh, but, but also relative poverty tends to stagnate uh, when uh, median incomes grow faster and it's harder uh, for poorer families to, to keep up. So it's quite a complicated picture in terms of what drives the uh, final outcome on relative poverty. And the benefit system is one element of that, but it has to sit within a wider context. Uh, so uh, that's why UC incentives, which are good and have improved, um, are being reinforced by increases to the living wage and also increases to the personal tax allowance. Um, so uh, you have to kind of see that all together, not just what's happening on the benefit side, but also wages and taxes. Um, and then, of course, much wider government agendas also have to come together. Um, so in terms of trying to get people to work more, it's not just about incentives. It's also about what employers are willing to offer. And all of the good work that um, the UK government's doing and you are doing uh, to halve the disability employment gap, to eliminate the gender pay gap, um, and to make work fairer and decent for all, uh, all comes into play alongside uh, what happens in the benefit system. And finally, um, it's obviously much more likely to be in in-work poverty if you have children. And so a big element of that, we know uh, that uh, one-earner couples uh, tend to be one-earner couples because somebody's looking after the children um, and uh, lone parents also face uh, barriers to working because they've got uh, childcare responsibilities that they have to deal with on their own. So childcare is a really important element to this story as well. Um, and universal credit um, is more generous uh, on the childcare side uh, than tax credits was. Alongside that, um, the UK government um, and the Scottish government is doing more to um, subsidise free childcare places. But it's not just about what government can do to subsidise childcare. It's also about uh, the provision in the market and whether flexible childcare is available to people in kind of low-paid work. So I think what... Um, I hope I've managed to make the point that um, in-work poverty is, is kind of the collection of a lot of different things coming together, um, especially if you look at it in a relative sense. And the benefit system is one element within a wider context. And the UK government has been very concerned about this issue too um, and has tried to see all of these elements together. That's helpful, Donna Ward. It, it might be worth placing this inquiry into some context as well because um, I mean m much of what you said there which was helpful um, mixed between delivery of the policy intent of the UK government and the policy intent of the UK government. We had hoped next week to have had the UK Secretary of State Esther McVeigh here uh, along with uh, the Scottish Cabinet Secretary uh, Shirley Ann Somerville. Um, this morning we received a reply from Alok Sharma, MP, the Minister of State for Employment, uh, who has agreed to come to our committee, but waited six weeks for a reply from the Secretary of State. We got a reply this morning from the, the Minister of State. Unfortunately, they won't be available for this, this particular inquiry. And there are maybe some policy matters we'd wish to interrogate, and it's whether we interrogate that with DWP staff, uh, lead staff, senior staff, or with the relevant politicians. Unfortunately, they, 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 they are not available uh, to us. I also note you put um, a, a number of statistics uh, on the record there in relation to poverty. Uh, I, I, and I think those are quite crucial because you were making a point about part-time employment and full-time employment. And the Poverty Alliance, who prepared a briefing for the Universal Credit Debate in the Parliament last week, have stated that one million people in Scotland are living in the grip of poverty, including 230,000 children, that 65% of all children living in poverty 
uh, leaving the poverty line are the working households and that 59% of all working age adults living in poverty live in working households. So obviously getting people into employment does not solve poverty in itself because of the nature of low paid uncertain employment uh, in, in in Scotland and, and, and across the UK. Uh, now that brings us to uh, the merging of the tax credit system into universal credit and the idea of putting conditionality on those quite often in part-time work uh, who will no longer receive tax credits but they will receive universal credit and the idea that they will be asked or encouraged or eventually instructed to increase their hours of work or to increase their hourly rate or to take on a second job. These are all clear things that work coaches could request or eventually instruct individuals who are working to do. Um, so we asked the PCS, we asked the uh, workers' representatives in the job centres in relation to how realistic they thought it was to have a meaningful conversation with someone uh, who is in work, uh, to have that meaningful conversation, tailored conversation with them, uh, to be realistic about what the expectations were to move into better paid employment if those opportunities actually exist at all. Uh, and David Semple from PCS told us the current number of work coaches simply would not be able to do that work in any meaningful way. Given the additional footfall of claimants into our job centres, the number of job centres has been cut over the past couple of years, as the committee will be aware, it would not be sustainable for work coaches to have meaningful conversations and to raise the kinds of questions that you have mentioned. That was myself talking about whether there was available opportunities for work, whether there was suitable childcare, whether there was suitable transport links, the whole gambit of things you would have to have a conversation uh, with, with an individual about. So the union doesn't think it's achievable. They've said they think there has to be 5,000 additional staff in the system to make universal credit work, but here we are. It's rolling out. How would you respond to that? One for me to start with, and Denise may want to come in. Um, I think... I mean, first of all, the points about in-work conditionality, um, there's a very light touch uh, system in place now, so we're not asking work coaches to do that now. We would acknowledge that if we did want work coaches to start uh, having intense conversations with people in work, that would require more resources, but that's not something we're asking them to do now. That's not a plan uh, that we've got in place. So we, we ran a trial, um, the in-work progression trial that we published the results of back in September this year um, that did test a range of different things that work coaches could do um, to help people progress in work. And I sort of stepped back a bit as well that if we're concerned about in-work poverty, then people who could work more, uh, I think we'd all like them to be able to work more it's about how we can enable that because that's something that could combat in work poverty so we ran that trial actually that that showed that if you did do some fairly intense things um, and the intense things were uh, at the most intense it was a it was a uh, an intervention after eight weeks so a 10 minute conversation with a work coach after eight weeks and then every eight every two weeks after that um we would have a further conversation, face-to-face -face conversation with uh, with the person who was in work, that actually did lead to, to wage increases on average, so the people that had those interventions did work more. Now, we need a lot more evidence, uh, a lot more research, um, before we'll be in a position to, to say what the best way forward on this, because we don't have um, evidence at the moment about what really could work, what's the best way of interacting with people in work because they've got jobs to go to um, they don't need to be popping down to the job center every every five minutes um, so we need to get that that evidence um, we've got uh, funding from the budget i think it was budget 2017 eight million pounds from the treasury to do that sort of research over the course of, of four years and by doing that we'll learn what works and we'll think about um, the best way forward but as things stand we're not asking our work coaches to spend any significant amount of time helping those people in work to progress Denise did you want to add anything from can operate? I just before you come in there yeah. Denise because that raises some additional questions as much as it does um, answers so you've said at this time it's a light touch approach but it, but it won't always be a a light touch approach, and you've said that there will be no there will be 
no moving from a light touch approach until there are additional resources for the for, for the avoidance of doubt by moving away from a light touch approach do you mean sanctions and conditionality on the working poor it, it could mean a whole range of things that's that's what but, we want to but could it mean that could, could it mean uh, someone who's currently in receipt of tax credits moving over to universal credit have been told to get more hours or increase their pay and if they're unable to do that there could be a financial sanction on them is that what you mean by moving away from light touch as I said, it could mean a full, a broad range of things. At but the extreme, is, is, at is the that extreme, one of is that one of the things? If it, conditionality would certainly be part of it, so that's one of right. the things that we look so, to so, test. So, so that's so that's a yes. That that's important to know. Just just for clarity, because you might speak at length and we don't actually get the clarity that we're looking for. So now you said there's need for additional resources. Now the PCS have said five thousand more employees uh, are required at the front line to have any kind of meaningful uh, uh, conversation. Is that a number you would recognise, Mr Serrell? No, no I, I don't recognise that number. I don't know on what basis uh, the PCS would have calculated okay. that because they don't know what the intervention would be. We don't know what the intervention would be. We want to test, we want to learn. And when we've tested and learned, we'll work out what the best way forward is. Then we'll be able to work out what additional resources would be required. What I can say for sure is... We're staffing our work coaches to do what we're currently asking them to do. If we asked them to do an awful lot more, we would need more resources. That's something we would have to work out in the light of the research. Now, the PCS would see you're understaffing them for what you're asking them to do just now, especially if you look at the service centres where they just cannot cope with uh, entries into online journals as things currently stand. How many additional workers minimum do you think we'd have to put in the system to allow meaningful... Because actually, we don't have to know what the conditionalities would be. We just have to know that the expectation is that Job Centre Plus or DWP expects work coaches to sit down and build up tailored relationships, build up trust with those in work at a job centre. That takes more staff. You must surely have a figure for how many more staffs need. You know how many people are in the tax credit system. You know, many, you know how many people are coming over through managed migration, you must surely know how much more staff you need in job centres to do this. I think I've explained why it's impossible for us to know that at the moment, because we don't know what we want to do. If we wanted them to spend an hour a week with each of these people, that would cost a certain amount. If we wanted mm. them to spend 10 minutes every month, that would cost an awful lot less and require a lot less resources. What, we are testing. What would they know? That's a very good, that's a really good reply. So could you tell me how many additional work coaches we need for an hour a week? I, I couldn't because I haven't, I haven't got those numbers in front of me. Can you but, tell me how much it would be for 10 minutes a month? No, I, I haven't got those figures in front of me. All I'm saying is we've got a programme of work over the course of four years to find out what the right interventions are. We will develop that, how much it will cost, what extra resources would be required would be part of that. Uh, now seems highly premature to, to have abstract conversations about, well, if it was 10 minutes, if it was an hour, what would that involve? I, I just don't have those figures. It would seem pretty uncoordinated and poorly planned if you hadn't done some modelling work in relation to this. So have you done any modelling work in relation to how many? It seems if you agree with the PCS, additional staff are required. So what modelling work have you done to recognise that additional staff are required to have meaningful conversations with the working poor that are going to have conditionality placed on them? So what, what, what work have you done in relation to that? I, mean, I think I've, I've made it very clear that we're looking at this over the course of the next three or four years to work out what extra interventions we'd require. Then, as part of that, we will model what the, the, work, the workload implications and the resourcing implications are of that. I, I, I don't see why three or four years ahead of, uh, of actually doing something, we would have modelled what the impact might be under various different scenarios. We haven't, we haven't done that research, to the best of my knowledge, uh, and I think it would be premature to have done so. OK, I'm not sure I agree with you, but that's the answer. Uh, Alistair Allen. Um, thank you, convener, uh, and thank you for, for uh, appearing here today. Uh, I think it would be interesting to pursue some of the, the um, lines of uh, inquiry around what the, the PCS said to us in evidence uh, at, at our last hearing uh, and give you the opportunity to respond to some of what's been said. The, the convener has already raised some of the issues. I suppose the issues I'm keen on finding out about are about the general state of preparedness um, uh, of the system uh, to cope with the rollout of universal credit. Um, for instance, uh, one, one issue that was raised was, um, uh, and one thing I questioned last week was about um, the, the digital first approach um, to, to dealing with, with uh, people who come through the system. 
Uh, I just wonder, can you offer some comment on, on the state, A, the state of preparedness internally to cope with this, and, and B, the, the, um, the capacity of, of such a system to cope with people who simply don't have access to the internet, given the serious claims that were made by the PCS uh, in their evidence that, that the system is prepared for, for neither? Yeah, okay. Um, so <clears throat> my accountability, <coughs> excuse me, my accountability is to make sure that we're prepared. So um, the first thing is resources, so I'll take that first. Um, certainly our resources, I'm running at a higher rate than expected. So I've got against my allocation in, uh, in the department for Scotland. For work coaches, I'm around about between 100 and 150 on paper, too many work coaches. Now, that isn't too many in my view because I'm preparing for increase in caseloads as we migrate to roll out. So that's not in work, that's people that are at work or people who are making a new claim to, to benefit. We're seeing many more people, remember, that are um, pre-work capability assessments. We're seeing them from day one. So in uh, work coach terms, I am comfortable we're on the right um, right trajectory. Um, for case managers, I'm well below the average expected at this point in time for caseloads. So um, again, what I've done is looked forward, made sure that we're in advance of the curve, made sure that our resources in each of the service centres are on an ongoing build to keep pace with the rollout as it goes up to December. Um, so that's the resources. Sorry, the second part of the question. Well, the, the, the question the I suppose digital. is the Absolutely. question is about whether the, the digital first approach is either going to work internally uh -huh. or going to work uh -huh. for people who don't uh -huh. necessarily have uh -huh. access or ability uh -huh. to, to, con uh -huh. to contact you by those means. Yeah. So it depends where you are in the country. Um, so if we're in the central belt, um, there is lots of provision to support customers, we make contact with our partners in the locality, and also I think you went to Dundee, you saw what we've done in the front of house where we've put digital access and people to support people when they come in to get digital access. Now that's the same in every single job centre. Um, we've also... Just to interrupt you then, you raised an important point there about depends where you are in the country. I apologise for, for breaking your, your flow, your train of thought there, but you see it depends where you are in the country. I should say at this point that I represent the Western Isles. Uh, and if you live in the US, there aren't even any job centres within 100 miles. That's right. So how does it work in that situation? So in that situation, um, firstly, what we do is we contact the customer. We see when they're available. If they can't get across to the mainland, then what we're doing is take either sending a visiting officer the other way or what we're trying to do is make sure that we take the claim over the phone and then progress it. Um, when the individual can come in, because they do need to sign their claim commitment, they do need to have a conversation. Um, and then what we're trying to do is do it through journals and through the phone. So, you know, where it's appropriate to actually bring somebody in because they need more intensive support, because some of that provision that they might need might be on the mainland rather than on the, on the island. Um, but generally, that's the process. Because picking up on that, and this is, this is relevant across the country, not, not just to, to rural areas, what, one of the one of the issues that was raised in our last evidence session was was about the potential unintended consequences, uh, not so much of, of going digital, because everybody accepts that that, that, is, that is the future, if you like, but for the very significant minority of people who, who simply can't or, or are unable to access that system, um, one of the, the issues that was put to us uh, in the evidence really was that... Um, that group of people not being able to access um, the, the system online will uh, lead, in the view of the, the unions, to a, a large increase in pressure on the, the telephone option, if you like, and will lead um, to delays in, in, in um, applications and contact being processed simply because of that pressure that will be created uh, on the phone system. So is that a, a claim you would understand or accept? It's not the experience. I, I mean, it is a, an issue that we are working hard to make sure either people are connected to services to support them or actually, you know, there is a tele telephony service as well. But it is digital first, as you said. So it is building the competence and capability of the individuals that are making the claims. Lots of our services across the whole of the UK and, and in Scotland are going online. Um, but... Um, for me, I'm not seeing that impact on the claiming process. 
The process is you make a claim online, you're then directed to a phone to make an appointment. And at that stage, our phone uh, service identifies if anybody needs any special support. And that could be that they can't get in or that actually they've got health issues and need a visiting officer. If somebody then doesn't proceed to contact us, even if they've made the appointment, we're on the phone trying to make sure that we don't lose anybody through this new process, which is, you know, we've got to accept it's new. It's a transformation of services for the citizens of Scotland. Therefore, they need some support to understand how to navigate it. And just pick up on that, that point. If, if you find in the course of the next X months um, <coughs> that, that there are delays or problems around that, would, would that be enough to consider uh, pausing rollout while you sorted those problems, or would you press ahead? Well, I, we're 90% through new claim rollout, so I haven't seen that to date. Yes, there will be people that need further support. There'll be people that are referred to us from third sector. There'll be people we refer to partners. But and finally then, uh, thank you, Kavir, uh, for uh, trying your patience. But th finally, we do also have evidence from the, the Westminster Public, Account Public Accounts Committee um, about the, the wider attitude of the DWP when presented with problems. They, they've said that the department, I quote, the department's systematic culture of denial and defensiveness in the face of any adverse evidence presented by others is a significant risk to the programme. Uh, are they wrong on that? I mean, that may be more of a policy question than, a, than an operational question, I would guess. But I, mean, I think if you look back at the last um, year, um, so in Budget 17, we introduced 100% advances, we extended the repayment period to 12 months, we introduced a run-on of housing benefit for two weeks, we got rid of seven-day waiting days, then in June 17, we addressed issues that people had raised around severe disability premium. Um, in the budget, we've increased work allowances, which is something that have been put, I think, to this committee. We've reduced the deduction rate from 40 to 30 percent, again, raised with this committee. Um, we've introduced a further run on for job seekers allowance, income support, employment and support allowance. We've changed the, the approach for the self-employed by bringing in a broader 12 month um, uh, a grace period. So. To me, that is a sign of, of a government and a, a department that is listening and responding uh, to try and make this system work as well as possible. I, I can't really see how, with those facts, you can say that we haven't been listening. And can I add to that, Mr Allen? Because, um, you know, I see um, Child Poverty Action Group probably about every four months, and my team work with, his, work, work with John Dickey's team in between. They've got an early warning system. We look at that early warning system to try and understand if there's any trends. So I certainly think we l listen from an operational sense. That's just one stakeholder, Citizens by Scotland, Scottish Federation for Housing, I see them regularly and we take information from them from an operational sense and we tend to talk about two things, one's the policy context and one's the operational context. So, I, you know, I think we are, I think we are. Um, my, my Deputy Convener um, it was quite right, just we should, we should mention to me that we should maybe just check a couple of figures that we got last week um, from the PCS and I appreciate that my initial questioning was concerns that the, the unions had raised in, in relation to workload, but figures that came up last week were that the caseload for work coaches could go from uh, significantly below 100 to estimated 343. And a second figure we had was those in the service centres who are having to look at these online journals, their caseload could go up to almost 900. Now, that seems incredible but these figures must have came from somewhere PCS recognised those figures they've clearly looked at what they think the increased workload to be and those are the ones that were discussed last week and the committee was genuinely deeply alarmed by that increase in the workload um, I guess it brings us back again I don't want to flog a dead horse I really don't but it brings us back again to what uh, Miss Horsfall you're having to deal with the management of workload for the teams out there what numbers would you recognise? So I'm, we are less than the average nationally, and that is less than 80 at the moment per work coach, which is, I think, or 85, the figure that PCS quoted. And certainly our case managers, the average is around, at the moment, 330. OK, and 
you would you would agree that that will increase over the next few years? It will certainly. Well, there's it's activity. Certainly, if I can, can I talk about the the workload for case managers? So, workload for case managers is the activity on the caseload. So, the more automation there is to payments, the less activity there will be. So, caseloads will rise the more automation we get. So, it's a false thought that there is a limit that's unworkable. The issue is that we're working on what is a reasonable caseload for case managers, what can they do, what we want them to do is clear the work so that customers are certainly serviced in the way that we want. And at the moment, that's happening. Now, in work coach terms, it comes back to what Mr. Sell said, which was that actually at this time, the numbers are not at the level that PCS are quoting. They're obviously quoting something from somewhere. I don't recognise. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't recognise for some time in the future. Now, presumably, they've looked at the whole population and divided that by the number of people we've got now. Well, that's not the reality. We've already talked about we need to understand what the system will be and then we'll resource it appropriately. Look, that's helpful. There's, it's just there's generally a, a disconnect between the union representing the workers on the ground and DWP in relation to what, what, what workload looks like, or we wouldn't have had that evidence last week, and we're just very keen as a committee to make sure that ends, and the alarming statistics we heard last week are addressed in a meaningful way that improves the service for people on the ground that, that are very worried about what universal credit mean, means for them, but I, but I have to let other committee members in my poll. I, I am now testing the patience of my committee members. Mr Serrell, briefly. Just very, very briefly, I mean, just to add to that point, we would expect those, those caseloads to go up over time for a range of reasons. You know, one is that actually the mix of cases changes, so the mix of cases mm. on UC now, universal credit now, is fundamentally... Sort of unemployed people who we see every two weeks, um, so that requires quite a lot of activity. The new cases, many of them will be um, less intensive regimes, so, so actually work coaches can increase their caseload. The other point is a lot of these work coaches are new, so you know they're building up their experience, so over time the average experience of a work coach will increase and they'll be able to deal with more cases. So there are a number of reasons why we'd expect it to increase and that to, for that to be okay. I think a lot of us just can't. We bring my deputy uh, there in a second. Yeah, yeah. I, ju I, would, I just would like to press you on this because I find that unbelievable <laughs> what you've just said there. Um, so we know that there's going to be a migration from people on tax credits who are currently administered by the HMRC. So how can you possibly say that you don't expect the workload to increase when you're going to take tens of thousands of people into the DWP system? Previously, weren't that just does not total the total workload will increase, but then as we bring people on tax credits across uh, and increase the universal credit population, so we increase the number of yeah. work coaches. Yeah. So it's the it's the average per work coach I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, yes, the workload will increase. But when I say again that tax credits cases, particularly with the very light touch conditionality regime, we've got they don't require that much activity from work coaches. Someone who's unemployed and actively seeking work, that requires quite a lot of activity. So the mix is really important. I think what you're getting, Mr Sarah, was just that you should go back and look at the official report from last week if you didn't catch it before you came along to the committee. Because that whole discussion about a work coach is going to have with someone who is maybe in a part-time employment about how far it's reasonable to travel to get a second job, to bring up to full-time hours, what the transport links are like, what that means for child care, what that means for caring issues if they're a care with other people in their family. That takes a lot of knowledge and sensitivity and relationship building with, with, with an individual for a work coach to do. And PCS assured us they believe that they have workers at the front line who have got the skills to do that. What they don't have is enough of them and they don't have enough time. So that's the disconnect, and there's a difference of opinion between yourselves and what and what the unions have said, but I think it's just fair to put that on the record. I think that's where the, the disconnect comes. Uh, we'll go to Mark Griffin. Thank you, Kamira. Um, good morning. You will know that uh, many members here have a concern about the single household payment and universal credit, and um, members of this parliament, across all parties, uh, unanimously um, supported an amendment to the Social Security Act um, to start discussions between the Scottish Government and the UK Government about implementing an automatic split payment and universal credit 
in Scotland. Can I just ask while you're here um, about the progress of discussions on that policy? Well, that's something in principle we've we've agreed um, to do. It's you know it's uh, it's it's um, prerogative of the Scottish government to uh, to request that change. I think we're in discussions now about exactly what the nature of the the policy that the Scottish government would want to have around uh, split payments would be. And once we know that, then we can work through what it would take to deliver that and what the timetables might be. But it's it's that sort of discussion that I understand is 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 going on. Now we've already introduced the other flexibilities around uh, payments to, to landlords uh, and around more frequent payments, but the split payments one is something we're we're still discussing with the Scottish government. Okay, um, members have had a concern about the, the single payment and universal credit, and I fear that that would um, exacerbate situations of um, domestic abuse. And the reason I, I asked that is because I wanted to move on to the. Uh, the managed migration and the natural migration process. Now, through the managed migration process, um, people moving <coughs> from um, tax credits to universal credit will thankfully um, receive transitional protection. Uh, but those who move in the natural migration process through a change in circumstances, say perhaps um, a breakdown in a relationship will not receive transitional protection. Now, similarly to the concerns that we have about a, a split payment, I would have concerns that um, the managed migration process attracting transitional protection would affect people's behaviour and that it could encourage um, a woman who is experienced in domestic abuse to stay in that abusive relationship so that they would get the transitional protection with a managed migration process, um, rather than going through the natural migration process, what's your view on that? Um, well, I think step back a bit. I mean, clearly the most important thing here is to address the the, the fundamental domestic abuse, which is something we'd all be, um, you know, firmly in favour of, of of stopping through whatever means possible. I mean, there are currently uh, single payments across the whole of the benefit system already, so. Um, and it's not as though we're moving to a to a very different place. I think the natural migrations um, and managed migrations point. If someone uh, uh, you know splits up and effectively it's a new claim at that point, um, then the circumstances have changed quite dramatically. So I'm not sure what you would uh, transitionally protect uh, if they if they moved across to uh, to universal credit because their, their their claim circumstances are very are very different. But what I can say is. You know, we take great care to make sure our work coaches and, you know, one thing I think me and the PCS would agree on is that our work coaches are absolutely fabulous and extraordinarily capable people. Take great care in making sure they're alive to and aware of domestic abuse issues and know how to respond to that. So most important that they can link up with other organisations locally to try and help people with that, that fundamental problem. Okay. And sorry, can I just add that I, I did see the transcript with the evidence from the PCS and uh, they did mention, of course, they did acknowledge that um, quite a lot of people uh, do actually gain from moving over to uh, universal credit. Uh, so um, th they were also um, quite keen uh, not to uh, slow down uh, migration or stop it completely, given that um, there were a lot of families, especially those people working very few hours, who would gain from the new system. It's not just a one-way thing that, um, you know, people would automatically have less money. Yep, I think PCX acknowledged that there would be winners and losers, but from the analysis that we've seen that one of the losers um, would be lone parents. Um, one of the, the big losers in the system would be lone parents and um, disabled people, so that then raises um, the concern as to whether um, a mother would choose to stay in a... Um, an abusive relationship to protect the financial stability of the, the children and that's why um, I raised the question but um, if I could move on to another issue that um, I raised and discussed with um, PCS last week was about um, fluctuating earnings in particular um, an example in my um, own region where um, a local authority um, pays their workers on a four weekly cycle and will be paying their workers um, early um, in December before staff leave 
for Christmas and the impact that is going to have on their universal credit claim, where because of the number of payments within a particular month, um, that they will receive no universal credit. And the PCS um, representative last week said that there were um, technical um, options available to them in previous systems. They have looked at smoothing um, earnings out over a 12-month period to stop something like that happening. Are you looking at um, what technical options there are available to stop something like that happening? We're certainly aware of aware of the issue, um, at, but that monthly assessment period is, a, is an absolutely fundamental core part of the universal credit system, um, and that does. And the, re the reason it's it's monthly is because uh, the majority of employees get paid monthly. Um, so if we had any other assessment period, if we had a fortnightly assessment period or something, then some fortnights we get uh, a, a, all the payment and other fortnights we get none of the earnings and so so universal credit will go bouncing up and down greatly so that's why we've got a monthly assessment period it does as you rightly say mean that for those uh, uh, employees who are paid on a four weekly cycle there will be um, months in the year uh, when uh, for our universal credit calculation, we're seeing two lots of, of earnings. Um, you know, it might be one or two months in the year. What I would say is that those are predictable. So, so we want our work coaches and you know the individuals to, to see those things coming and to try and uh, budget. And we can help people currently with local authorities, but also with um, from from April with assistance advice, help people to to build budgeting skills. But we think. Budgeting uh, to to cope with those uh, those periods is the most important thing, and, and what we can do in the short term, rather than anything more structural around universal credit. And one other point I'd make on fluctuating earnings, um, you know, actually, particularly at the bottom of the labour market, there, there is an awful lot of earnings fluctuation um, that people have, not necessarily the full weekly point, but they could be paid monthly or or weekly. Universal credit is very helpful in that respect because um, if someone's earnings are, are high one one week or one month, um, then universal credit will will be slightly lower, so it will smooth the income. If they if their income their earnings are, are low another month, then universal credit will rise. So actually, universal credit helps in those circumstances to give people a slightly smoother, more predictable um, level of income from from month to month. Okay, and what what exactly? Our work coach is doing with um, claimants to uh, help them predict how much universal credit they'll get in each month. I mean, it's something we're 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 looking to build up with work coaches. So, as part of their relationship with uh, with people, to see those sort of patterns of earnings, and then through the journal, through communication with the customer, help them to to see that um, that coming, um, that point coming where they do have two payments and, and recognise that their universal credit will drop. We're certainly making sure that our work coaches um, uh, give um, ensure that people, if they do need to reclaim universal credit afterwards, uh, they can be helped to, to do that sort of rapid reclaim rather than any sort of longer term process. Now, if you want to add anything, uh, Denise? Yeah, so the arrangements locally is is to pick up those points you know where are the employers that actually the um the wage cycles are predictable and therefore can, when can we expect somebody to not receive universal credit for example in december because of two wages maybe and therefore they've got to make a reclaim in january or is it okay because it is just fluctuating as as mr sell says so um uh the other side of that is uh, in budgeting terms, each of the work coaches know who their support systems are around budgeting support, either through the local authority or through systems advice or through charities. So it is about wrapping around that support and also bringing them into the job centre as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, is that a supplementary or a question, Pauline? No, no, it's merely a question. Okay, okay. Pauline McNeil. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> there's a few different areas I want to ask you about, and I'm quite keen to get some stuff on the record so I clearly understand what you're saying. Um, can I begin with um, the transition of uh, tax credit and child's tax credit, which I mentioned earlier? Um, could you just clarify at the moment, um, those families or those individuals, uh, is that calculated on a monthly basis? To tax credits. Um, I think tax credit's probably fortnightly. I'm, 
I'm not sure, uh, uh, but I don't, I don't think that's month. Well, actually, tax credits is, is on an annual basis, and then it's paid. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's 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 assessed with a, a forecast essentially of, of earnings yeah. over the course. That's of the what year. I thought. It's just that you said in answer to Mark Griffin that the reason that you use the monthly assessment is that's what the majority of people do. But there will be literally millions of people who have tax credits calculated on an annual basis. So surely you accept that that does not fit with the model. Well, I think the problem with um, the annual assessment on tax credits is actually that um, huge numbers of people have ended up owing um, a lot of money back to the system because the reassessment periods are so infrequent. Um, so um, actually tying uh, the subsidies for low paid work with an annual uh, tax assessment uh, doesn't actually uh, fit in with um, a lot of people's experiences. So I think one of the things that um, we know with people moving across from tax credits is actually a lot of people have built up debt to government through the tax credit system. And I think that's something that universal credit is going to make sure it does not replicate. But on a monthly basis, people might actually, because you have admitted that the fact that you're saying that people may have to tie to budget would indicate that you think there will be month-to-month -month losses for those, for many families. It will, it will smooth out in the sort of cases we're talking about, you know, over a period of time, um, it, the amount they receive from universal credit will be pretty well the same um, as if they were paid monthly. Uh, it's just that there will be that month where it goes down and other months it will be uh, potentially slightly slightly higher, so um, it's smooth. The issue that, that Donna raises is quite right around uh, around tax credits, where you you know you do because it's it's I would say quite a clunky annual reassessment system. Then people do find that what they received last year was either you know much more than they should have done, or actually sometimes less, um, and that leads to um, to debts or or money that's due to them. Um, Universal Credit tries to correct that by, by making sure it's calculated on a monthly basis on the basis of what people have actually earned, uh, been paid by their employer in that month, and adjusting Universal Credit accordingly. That takes a lot of the burden off uh, of customers uh, as well. So I think the, the Director of Universal Credit himself said that uh, probably most people don't know that they will be transferring from the HMRC system to the WP. Would you accept that? I, I don't know whether most people would know or not. I, mean, I think Universal Credit has, has received quite a lot of coverage, it seems to me, so I think people will uh, know a reasonable amount about it. I and mean, what I would say about the timetable, um, and I think this is I mean, it's highly public but not necessarily very well known, is that we've now, as, as Denise said, pretty well rolled out new claims on Universal Credit across the country. So we're sort of 90% there, and by the end of this calendar year, essentially uh, all new claims to, to those benefits will be to universal credit rather than to tax credits or something like that then you've got the stock of cases on on existing benefits like tax credits um, we will be testing in the latter part of uh, of next year and uh, the months uh, that follow into 2020 testing in a very light touch way something like 10,000 cases uh, in total uh, that migration process because it's really really important we get that right for, for you know for all of our customers but particularly for the more vulnerable and it's not until 2020 the latter part of 2020 that we would start to to move people across uh in a in a in a large scale way and we will do that through until 2023 so I think if we started warning people now uh, who might move in 2021, uh, that would feel premature to me. Now, clearly, we need to make sure we give them plenty of notice, and that's our, you know, absolute determination to do that. Um, but I, you know, we haven't we haven't started warning people individually now because it's so far away. So earlier, you challenged the figures that were outlined to you by uh, Convener Bob Doris that were given to us by PCS. So. Um, so I've had a chance to check that, but the figures that Bob Doris is quoting, so that workload increase for work coaches is the figures from the National Audit Office and not PCS, which say that the uh, work caseload of individual uh, work coaches by 2024 will be that figure of 919. Were you aware of that? Because you seem to challenge the PCS figures. Uh, I, I don't 
think we challenged the figures. We just said we didn't entirely recognise them. If they're, if they're from the National Audit they Office are. report, I, I, I can accept that. And I know the National Audit Office did. So, so can, uh, I, can I ask Denise Horsfall then... Um, I seem to get the impression earlier that you didn't really acknowledge that there would be a significant increase for work coaches earlier. I think I'm dealing with this year and okay. next year. Yeah, I'm not dealing with managed migration. Managed migration, okay. in my mind, is a is a decision about how we intervene with customers. All wrapped up with that, what do we do within work? All of those decisions still need to be made. So how can I agree or disagree, really? I well, can't. because the National Audit Office have well, published these figures. Well, fine. So I, you I, don't I, accept them? No, I'm not saying don't I don't accept, accept them. them. I, can't, I can only recognise that that's what the National Audit Office say. What I'm saying is my experience is delivery. Delivery this year and right. next year, I know I've got enough resource to actually so, manage business. So really the, business. the panel are really not in a, t a position then to challenge any of the figures at the moment because you'd say you don't know. But I... As I said, I don't think we have challenged them. We've just said we, we didn't recognise this. If they're in the National Audit Office them. report, then that is what the National Audit Office have okay. said. Um, I think I was quite clear in saying we recognise that caseloads would increase and would increase quite significantly for the reasons that I set out earlier on okay. and that we feel that, that actually is perfectly well within the bounds of what work coaches can do because of the change in the mix of, of cases and because of the automation that, that Denise uh, referred to and because of the, the level of experience. Um, those precise figures may or may not be okay, right. So, thank you. So, so just finally, I just want to pressure me a bit more then on the what your evidence is in relation to light touch. Okay. Um, so is it your understanding, how long will the light touch regime remain in place? Because I think it's an interesting use of language. I mean, I might be reading this wrongly, but the way I'm reading it is that it might be short term. And I just wondered if I'm wrong about that. Um, and if what factors would be taken into account, because obviously light touch is kind of a meaningless phrase. For example, um, so as I understand it, you saw a claimant or someone who's in work claiming universal credit would be expected to aim to earn 35 hours uh, on the living wage and, and reach that progression. So what factors will be taken into account by work coaches in this light touch regime? Uh, shall I start, Denise? And you want to, yeah, I, mean, I, I think um, 35 hours is if someone uh, you know, is in a position to work 35 hours a week. So if someone's got care and responsibilities, uh, uh, you know, disability, something else that means that 35 hours a week is not appropriate for them, then that figure would be would be small. It could be 24, it could be 16. It depends on their circumstances. The discretion of the work coach, or will you be issuing guidelines that these are the sorts of things that can be discounted? I mean, Denise might be better than me on exactly mm. what material work coaches have, but you know, always it I think that's be quite discretion important within, to understand within because I would like, well, you would expect people would want to know. So, if you have sick children, if you yourself have health issues, if you're looking after elderly parents, um, and the consequences of moving from what might be a secure job to an insecure job, sh I would presume these are all factors that your work coaches would take into account. So, really, I'd like to press you on. Are you giving discretion to individual work coaches or will you be issuing guidance to administer that? Do you want, do you want to answer the question on the basis of current it's system? Bit, and I can then come back to uh, yeah. the light touch point because I think this is fundamentally now about uh, people out of work. Absolutely. So, so answering for people that are out of work at the moment rather than what you're trying to get to, which is in work support. Um, at the moment, people arrive, you know this, we do the claim commitment, we sit down and over a period of meetings try and identify with the individual what they can do and what they can't do. And if somebody's perfectly capable, has just come out of a job, full-time job, what they're obviously going to be looking for is a full-time job, if that's what they tell us and they haven't actually, circumstances haven't changed and they've got any other barriers. But obviously if somebody's come to us and they're not working at the moment for whatever reason, then it's that that we're trying to identify to make sure that whatever we do is personalised and reasonable. What we don't want to do is get to a position where we're asking people to do something or working with them and they agree to do something they can't. That's the worst of all scenarios. So that's how we work at the moment. If I give guidelines, the danger is, is somebody will go, 
Well, if somebody's a lone parent, then I'll ask them to do 16 hours. If they're somebody who can't work because of other barriers, they can do two hours. I think this is about trust, relationship building, and making sure it's personalised at every turn. And I use, I mean, use the, go back to the PCS point, I, mean, I think our work coaches are, are highly capable of doing that, and we've done a lot of work to professionalise them further. On the light touch point, I, mean, I just go back... Um, we, we, we have got four years' worth of funding to develop our understanding of what would work and hence what we want to do around this. We have no plans, uh, as I speak, to change from that, essentially, not, not doing much in terms of interventions for those people in, uh, in that light-touch conditionality regime. Um, so we're not, as things stand, we're not asking work coaches today, tomorrow, uh, or in a year's time to do anything in particular. When we do work that out then we're happy to come and talk to you again about about our plans but that's not something we have at the moment and it might be worth adding uh, uh, mr Sell sort of reminded me which is um it's the accreditation process so about a third of our work coaches over the last two years have gone through accreditation or apprenticeships so this is 14 months or up to 18 months worth of uh, work on um city of guilds and it is making sure that what we do is deepen the expertise of the work coaches so that in operational profession they really do understand and investigate how they can build their um, capability even further with support from tutors. Thank you. Okay. Michelle Ballantyne, I know you wanted to follow up a couple of supplementaries with the Deputy Convener's question. There are things have moved on, but would you want to come in now anyway? Yes, I would. Um, thank you and good morning. Can I just check um, the, the question that was asked about the National Audit Office figures around caseload? I mean, that was the average UK figure. When you initially answered, were you talking about UK or were you talking about Scotland? Scotland. Right, so that would account for the difference yes. in the figure. Thank well, you. Uh, yes. I mean, it will always. We're always at different trajectories around mm -hmm. recruitment and um, mm -hmm. and people in post and attrition, of course. Right. And the other one, just just a supplementary around conditionality that came from earlier as well. Um, th there's a tendency sometimes to talk about conditionality as though it's about penalising people, but my understanding is that it's it's actually about moving people on. So it's actually about engaging with them to how you take forward their opportunities within work and how they negotiate better, how they look and, and improve their work chances. Um, and that's about how they move out of poverty. So can you, can you just is, sort of clarify around conditionality? Because conditionality and sanctions um, are, are kind of framed in the same way. And they do have a relationship, absolutely, as I understand it. But can you just confirm when we talk about conditionality, what are we actually talking about? We, you're absolutely right. So we're talking about, um, you know, primarily now through the, the claimant commitment, the relationship we build up, our work coaches build up with, uh, with claimants, is what is the reasonable expectation that we can have of them, they can have of themselves, to look for work? And that will depend, you know, in the sort of way that Denise talked about, on their personal circumstances. But... You know, there is an expectation that they should make a commitment to, you know, do look for certain types of jobs, um, spend a certain number of hours each uh, uh, each day looking for for jobs. That's the conditionality, um, and actually, that relationship with a work coach, the feedback we've had from a great majority of claimants is 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 very positive. Now, there is a difference of view, I suspect, between the Scottish government and the UK government around sanctions. You know, if you have conditionality. Um, the UK government would believe that at the end of the day there has to be something, uh, you know, something sitting behind that, that if someone doesn't do what they've committed to do in return for, um, for the benefit payment the taxpayer is giving them, then there should be some consequence of that. And that's where sanctions come in. But sanction rates uh, you know, are actually uh, pretty low. So currently in universal credit, um, and I can go into more detail about this if you like, but in universal credit, it's only about 3% of, uh, of people are, are being sanctioned um, at the moment. It's, it's, a, it's a small minority of the caseload. Uh, you know, the other 97% are uh, uh, operating in fully in line with their claimant commitment, and many of them are moving into work as a, as a result. And, and in terms of the testing period for conditionality, you've said that you, you, you're going through a period now, starting now and going forward, on looking at what works. So when you say what works, what you mean i assume is is the success rate of people increasing their earnings getting into appropriate work um, and basically moving out of poverty 
Is, is that what you mean when you talk about testing? And will those results be published? Will they be easily accessible to us? Will we be able to follow that progress and know how, how it's going? I, I would entirely expect that to be the case. I and mean, I don't think we've got those detailed research plans yet. That's something we're working up. But it would be exactly that. So someone, you know, how long, if someone's moved into, into work, but it's, you know, a low number of hours, low earnings, and we think they're capable of doing more, then how long should we give them before we start, um, you know, ringing them up, contacting them and saying, well, perhaps you could do more, let's come in and have a chat about that. You know, that'd be one of the things we test, you know, would a shorter period be better or a longer period? Um, what's the best way of contacting that person? If they're working, uh, you know, certain hours, then actually it may be highly inconvenient to get them into the job centre. Maybe it's better to do something over the phone. We could test that or test face to face. Is it 10 minutes? Is it something rather longer? what sort of additional um, support uh, might they need. So, you know, it could be conversations about childcare, transport, a whole range of things. So looking at different ways of doing it and looking at the impact both on the person uh, while we're trying to, to help them to increase their earnings, so at that, at that initial point, but also the final impact in terms of, uh, of progression, which, you know, the whole, the whole purpose of this inquiry is around in work poverty so progression must be a good thing can i just say one thing on in work conditionality because mm. we've talked a bit as if tax credits didn't have any conditionality but actually you could only claim tax credits if you were working 16 hours and then it was 24 and 30 for couples so actually with universal credit being available to people even only working one hour um it is a very different uh system so on the one hand um it's expecting um you know it, it's being far more generous but obviously for um all of the reasons that we've been talking about around children being in poverty um, and other things. We don't want people to just uh, work very few hours. But I think um, I just wanted to clarify that obviously in the tax credit system, there's a very hard-edged conditionality that you don't qualify at all um, unless you're working um, a particular number of hours. Thank you. Can I go on to the other things, or do you want to come can, back can to I me? Bring, can I bring you back? Yeah, that's fine. Because I'm mm -hmm. testing the patience of a number of members just now, including your own there, Alison Johnson. Bring on back in. some of the, the areas we've, we've touched on already. I mean, I've had the experience of attending a, a hearing with regard to sanctions with a constituent who'd been sanctioned for his failure to attend two meetings at the same time that he hadn't arranged, one to sign on and one to attend an interview. Um, now, his appeal was upheld and the judge who heard it felt he was seeing too much of similar cases. Now, that clearly wasn't a case... You know, you couldn't describe that light touch in any shape or form. Um, the person concerned had then to apply for crisis loans in order to support their family. So I think, you know, whether or not this is light touch or the heaviest touch possible, this is a world first, I think. You're unprecedented in introducing in-work conditionality. Um, and I'd like to understand why it's... You know, it, it seems to me that there isn't an evidence base at the moment to suggest that this is a good idea or it's one that will have the, the positive outcomes that you're seeking. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, for a bit more on who decided this was a good idea in the first place. Well, shall I start, Donny? Well, yeah, I don't know whether we should just come back to the point that in tax credits, you obviously have to work a certain number of hours to qualify, whereas obviously in universal credit, you can get the in-work benefit by just working only one hour. So, um, it, you know, having some consistency between what people out of work experience and what people in work experience and what the taxpayer um, is uh, expected to fund, I think brings the whole system, uh, you know, into, to bring the whole system into alignment, you wouldn't have conditions conditionality for people uh, not working and then no conditionality for people working one hour. I think it's about it being one system but obviously then tailored um, according to uh, people's hours and, and what could be expected of them but you go on Pete. I mean, just a few points quickly in addition I mean I think I don't know about that that, that particular sanctions uh, those sanctions cases my guess is they were out of work cases rather than in work because um, you know I'm not aware of any significant number of sanctions for people in work, um, I, I would never describe our, our conditionality regime for people out of work who are expected to look full time for a job. I wouldn't describe that as light touch. You know that, that it is what it is, but it's that's not the light touch regime. The light touch regime is for people who are in work at the moment. Effectively, that light touch is so light touch that we're not we have no expectations uh, of people. When you say there isn't an evidence base, 
mean, I think, I think in a way you're you're agreeing with me. I'm I'm saying there isn't an evidence base, and that's why we want to carry on getting more evidence of what could work. If if that shows that actually um, it doesn't work, and we're better off uh, leaving people alone and letting them progress in their own right, then so then that that could be our conclusion, and we don't um, we don't change our policy. At the same time, um, people are being used as guinea pigs. People on low incomes, who may be very vulnerable in the first place, um, are testing out a system effectively. Uh, well, right now, no. I mean, we have had one trial, but we will have further further trials. Um, you could look at it another way, and I personally would look at it another way. It is again, I come back to the point. Fundamentally, we're here talking about in work poverty. So, we have a customer who is in work and they are poor, and we feel they could. Do more work they could increase their earnings wouldn't it be a um a failure in our organization not to think about not to work with them not to try to develop uh, uh, a program not to test things that could help that person to progress i i i think if we were doing nothing you'd be criticizing us uh for that, I mean, you could do more. Of course, you could be providing, you know, childcare costs up front, for example. But we've got a couple of cultural shifts here. I mean, in work conditionality, it's a shift for for people claiming. It's also a shift for DWP staff. There's another cultural shift. I mean, people on tax credits at the moment may not even feel that they are claimants. And I'd like to understand how much work has been done in making sure that they know that they're aware of the fact that they're going to have to make a claim. You know, has the DWP put resources into making sure that those people know that they will be expected to claim? What will happen if they don't claim? Will they simply be left without any money at all? Oh, you, you raise an extraordinarily important issue around managed migration and how we're going to make that work. I set out earlier on the timetable for that uh, and what we're going to be doing very carefully over the course of the next, you know, essentially it's two years before we start making those changes in a, in a large scale way is working out what works, working out how best to communicate with our customers. Because some people will respond straight away to a, to a letter. Other people, um, you know, may not. Um, they may have vulnerabilities. We need to test those things. We are working extraordinarily closely with, with stakeholders. Um, the department had a, a, a big uh, conference around managed migration with a full range of stakeholders uh, about a month ago. Uh, that was kicking off that process. How can we work together to co-design the process to try and make sure that we do smoothly move people across um, to, to universal credit? Um, we're absolutely determined to get that right. We're determined to work with people to, to, to design that correctly. Um, and that is you know, what we're going to be doing over the next one to two years. I mean, Professor Sir Ian Diamond has uh, expressed concerns that people may simply fall out of the social security system. And he has spoken of an unreasonable level of risk being put onto the claimant. I mean, do you share those concerns? I mean, that's what we're determined to to avoid by doing what I just set out, by having that, that sort of intensive period over the course of the next one to two years of, of testing, making sure we're designing that correctly to address the very concerns that Sir Ian Diamond uh, set out in that in that SAC report. So you know, we're determined that no one should fall through, through the net and we're going to work very closely with the full range of stakeholders to design a system that hopefully delivers that. Um, I hope so too. It's certainly, you know, one of the, the main drivers of universal credit was a simpler system. And I don't know how colleagues feel, but it seems remarkably complicated at the moment. And I do hope we get there one day. Thank you, convener. OK, thank you. Uh, George Adam. Thank you. Convener, good morning. Uh, where to start? We've heard quite a lot here this morning. I'll probably go back to the beginning. And during Donna Ward's initial statement she said we the dwp believe that universal credit is a really well designed is really well designed now we've had a debate on tuesday that says the exact opposite of that in this stage but you also said pete Serrell then on to say in work conditionality will be very light touch and then you further added to that by saying very light touch conditionality regime within the in work scenario now, surely these statements, surely these statements, with everything that's happened up until now with Universal Credit, surely these statements are nonsense, because that's not what we've been seeing in the real world. Surely there is no credibility for the DWP in these statements. Well, I, I, 
Sorry. I disagree. Sorry, Sorry. On, on the analysis of in-work poverty, which we've done quite a lot of, um, I was saying that once we broke down the population and in in-work poverty, the key issues were around um, uh, one-earner couples, um, people working part-time, very low-earning, self-employed, um, and the policy design around universal credit uh, is to try to help um, all of those households um, increase their hours. So um, the design of universal credit in terms of of, um, having expectations uh, of uh, people, unless they are caring, uh, to work more, including uh, second earners, um, and for people to increase their hours and to be able to move smoothly from out of work into work with smooth incentives to increase their hours. The, the policy design is all quite consistent with the analysis of the problem of what's driving um, in-work poverty, and, and that was the point that I was making. The problem is that the policy design isn't what's happening in the real world. In the real world, there are people who are suffering under the current regime. And uh, to say that we were going to transfer this migration to those in work, you know, there's no credibility for the DWP currently as we stand. But that's your opinion. That's, I don't recognise the world you're describing. You know, lots of people are talking about these problems. I admit we do not get it right every time. Well, that well, you don't recognise that world and you're working uh, actually to I, be helping I, these I, people. I go on to say, and Denise may come to I go out to job centres, talking to our work coaches, talking to claimants, um, you know, on a very regular basis. I was in a job centre on Monday. Denise will do it even more frequently than me. Actually, our work coaches, I go on to say, are, are fabulous people, really committed to making a positive difference to people's lives. They feel very strongly, very passionately, that the move to universal credit enables them to do that much more effectively than, than the legacy system. I go back, do we always get it right? No, sometimes we, we do get it wrong. And where we do fail customers, we want to hear about it and we want to try and put it right as quickly as possible. But the great majority of customers, I believe, we're making a positive difference for. Sometimes it's quite, it's quite it's more than sometimes, it's uh, the majority of cases that we get are on a negative universal credit. If you ask anyone in the public about universal credit, they would not come back to you and say it's a well-designed system. But moving on from that scenario, uh, Mr Searle said about the fact that we test and learn and it's very light touch, you know, I would say, and I've said before, it's more like test and ignore as the system's rolled out. But one of the things that we've had, uh, you, you said as time moved on, Mr Searle, you then went and said from very light touch you moved on to we have no expectations of people in work. So what, what, what does that mean then? Have you changed your mind during today's discussion or uh, are you not going to have conditionality? Are you not? Because you did say we have no expectations of people uh, in work. I mean, I think I've, I've already said it, but I can repeat it. So we call the regime light touch conditionality. But, you know, for all the reasons I've set out in, in practice now, we are not expecting our work coaches to uh, have a lot, a lot of conversations, spend a lot of time helping people in work to progress because we want to increase our evidence base to fill the gaps that your colleague uh, talked about earlier on so we really understand what the benefits could be of different interventions so that we can help uh, people to progress in work and address in work poverty. With the greatest respect, we're talking about families in work who are on the current tax credit system who are living on the edge financially. How are they going to feel that that's confident that you're just going to say it's going to be very light touch, everyone's okay, the system's had problems in the past but it's okay now and it should be okay for you? That still goes back to my original question of lacking credibility. I, I disagree. If someone's if someone's working, I mean, I feel like I'm being criticised for two different things. So if someone's working, uh, doing the best they can at the moment, uh, then uh, you know, absolutely, I don't think it would concern them particularly that we're we're, we're letting them progress in work on their own. Uh, we do want to help them further, and that's something we're looking to develop. We're looking to test. We're looking to to learn, and we will implement changes if we think they're appropriate in. A number of years time right now um, we're focusing on helping people to move into work um, rather than helping them progress once they're in work that is no different to the, to the current tax credit system so if someone's on tax credits um, they're not given any additional support uh, to progress in work so it's a continuation of the existing system we do want to improve it but we want to make sure we improve it in the right way mr Cyril, finally convener uh, miss Mr. Serrell, the whole situation is that you're talking about testing, and as my colleague already said, these are real people with real lives, and you're using them as guinea pigs in a system that you're not that already 
previously uh, before you go into in work uh, individuals that are working you know the system has had serious flaws you know and you're just carrying on regardless and that's the concerns for these people that we're dealing with it's real people with real lives and real families for me it's about continuous improvement and i you know i firmly believe in all walks of life all systems all people should focus on continuous improvement that's what that's the approach we're taking i think if we or any other department any other agency rolled out a system and said this is perfect um, we're not changing it then we would rightly be criticized what we're doing is rolling something out that we think is good but recognizing that everything could be improved and making sure we have that continuous feedback we test, we learn, we improve. That's that's the way we're operating the system. Test, I, learn, ignore. No, well, no, I, I, I did give you a list of about uh, about ten things that oh, the government well. has changed over the course of the last year. Doesn't strike me as as ignoring. I think a couple of points on on universal credit that's really important to to understand. First, universal credit now post budget um, costs more, is more generous on aggregate than the legacy system it, it replaces. So in twenty twenty three. It will cost two billion more pounds. We will spend two billion more pounds through universal credit. That that is, it's a more generous system on aggregate. Um, and the other point, crucially, which I think is really important, I imagine the committee will will be concerned about, is there are real issues because of the complexity of the current system around take up. So lots of people, both out of work and in work, don't take up all their entitlements. Universal credit, because it's one system, you know, you claim one thing, you get the whole lot will be greatly uh, beneficial to people in ensuring they take up all of their entitlements. So that's over £2 billion a year additional money going to some of the poorest in society because of universal credit who wouldn't get it under the legacy system. So some very important positive changes under universal For me, it's the policy intention and the reality seem to be the gulf. That's the point I've been trying to, to get across. I think we've got a genuine difference of opinion there. Uh, Mr Lindhurst, just before I moved to you, just before I moved to you, Mr Lindhurst, um, I, I promised um, to ask a specific question, which I don't expect you to answer. You can write to me afterwards if you want, but I've held five information events in my constituency so far in relation to the rollout of universal credit, supported by citizens advice, supported by local housing associations, welfare rights officers, and they've the, been the positive in getting a lot of information to vulnerable people out there. But I got a specific question after one of the events from a... Uh, um, um, employment, uh, employability and education advisor in one of the community areas. I'm just going to read it out. Um, as it was said, the question I, I, I asked was about the support available for refugees who have no or scant English. These poor souls have to apply for seven jobs a week, many while studying ESOL part-time at college with no computer skills. We have a couple of refugees participating in our computer classes and from what I have witnessed, even with English at pre-intermediate level, they take twice as long to pick up the vocabulary required to learn and understand uh, computers. Uh, what supports available for for this group? It's a very very specific question, but there are people with additional barriers to accessing a digital by default system. It could be English as a second language. People who have came through the asylum process and now have the right to work and claim benefits in the country. It could be the learning disabled. It could be a whole variety of others. Now, for time constraints, uh, with, with your permission, I do want to move to Mr Lindhurst, but I promise to ask that very specific question. Can I get a commitment that we'll, we can get a response to that? And perhaps Denise Horsfall, if that's... No problem. If that's OK. Absolutely. I, I would really welcome that, um, m m Mr Lindhurst. Yes, uh, thank you, convener. Um, I, think, I think from your answers to questions you recognize there have been various problems and difficulties with, with the system and also that it needs to be developed, improved and so forth as, as it's uh, rolled out and as, as we move into the future, if, if I understood you correctly. Um, I just want to come back on one point. I think the suggestion was made to you that uh, a system like this, um, indeed one with conditionality, has never been tried anywhere else in the world. Now, I'm just looking at the, um, uh, the German system, for example, just looking at the website about that, where conditionality seems to be um, inbuilt into the system. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. it's not the same as our system. And there are other European systems that one could look to where a very different approach to the previous UK approach to benefits is taken. Um, are you able to counter the suggestion that conditionality is something that is uh, new in, in on this uh, yeah, in this world's understanding of this sort of system? 
I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very important question. Absolutely, conditionality is is not new and is not unique to uh, to the UK, and it's something in this in this country, you know, has been very well tried and tested um, for people who are out of work. Um, so, you know, we've got an awful lot of experience, an awful lot of evidence, um, very robust evidence about what what works in terms of conditionality to help people move into work. What is not been greatly tested uh, internationally and, and not been greatly tested here yet is that well what about when people have moved into work but they could work more what um, you know what could help them to progress what uh, form of conditionality what form of interventions might actually help people to progress? that's the thing that I think we do need further evidence uh, on and that we've committed to, to do further work to, to investigate um, before we uh, uh, roll out any further changes. And the conditionality that we see in other European systems and indeed the intention of ours is it not to try and help people into work and assist them in their own particular circumstances. Do you agree that should be the goal of it? That absolutely should be the goal and that, that is the approach that we that we look to take. As I said, you know, the, the, the claimant commitment, the work, the work coaches are you know, really supporting, working with, forming good, positive relationships with uh, the customers uh, they have, helping them to progress. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, behind that, um, we do need that backstop, I think, of, of sanctions, but it is in the small minority of cases that we need to invoke that. The great majority of, of people, the great majority of relationships are very constructive. People do what they've committed to, uh, and that helps them to move into, into work. And can I just add to that, which is, you know, this balance of conditionality is also about making sure that the support is there and that we wrap around services so people can progress. So conditionality is only an expression of what can you do? And it's about trying to test the best that somebody can do. If they advise us that there are issues or they've got gaps in their CV or they've got gaps in their skills, it's what can we do to, um, to connect with other services that are around. So Skills Development Scotland, I can see in the future, and currently we, we're very close to them, but in the future will be a really good source of connectivity for our customers. We use them now, we use the world of work, we have relationships with Skills Development Scotland, but I can see that connection for this group of people being very strong. Okay. Um, Alistair Allen? Uh, yes, thanks. It was really just to pick up on some of the, the, the discussion there that um, came out of the, the questions um, which Alison Johnson asked uh, about tax credits. And obviously, and this has come through, obviously you, you'll, you'll appreciate that it will come as a big surprise to many people who've been receiving tax credits that their, the system is, is to be migrated in the future from, from HRC, as they would see it, to, to DWP. So I just wonder if you can offer a rationale for why that having happened, that that should be a reason for those people reapplying, or in many cases we feel they would have to reapply um, for the benefits that they got out of the, the tax credit system. Because, I, I, forgive me, but anecdotally, dealing as we do with constituents, I would reckon that the awareness that this is on the horizon is very low. So, so what's the rationale for people having to reapply for something they think they already have? Uh, well, partly it's a, it's a legal rationale. So, so legally, we couldn't just deem someone to have made a claim for, for universal credit. We can't pay someone universal credit without them having made formally made a claim. So that's, that's the process we have to initiate through that managed migration. Um, I, you know, I say again that, yes, I accept that many people on tax credits now won't really understand, uh, expect to be moved on to universal credit in, in a couple of years' time, three years' time. And to be honest, many of them might not expect to be on tax credits in two or three years' time. Their circumstances could change quite dramatically. What we will commit to do is to make sure we communicate with them early. We warm them up at the right time. We're clear about what they will have to do, what the timescales will be, what the process will be, uh, and help people to, to move across to universal credit in as smooth a way as possible. But given that these are people who have, have really, in many cases well, I've had very little um, dealing with the, the benefit system as they would understand it. Um, what modelling has been done to try to assess how many of the, the current group who would, who would uh, benefit from 
from tax credits would even begin to have any knowledge that this is on the horizon. I mean, obviously, I'm dealing here and others here, we admit we're dealing in anecdotes, but quite a substantial number of them, um, given our, our contact that we have with constituents. What I'm not hearing is any, as yet, any evidence that sustained modelling has been done to try to estimate in the UK how many millions of people understand that tax credits are going to um, become a thing of the past in their present form and that they will have to go through a reapplication process. Has any study been done of that or any attempt to measure it? Personally, I think what's important is that in two years' time, in three years' time, when it becomes time for those people to move across to universal credit, that with the right sort of notice, they know what they have to do. They're aware then, not that they're aware two or three or four years ahead of time. So um, our focus for the next two, three years is to really make sure we get that process right to make sure we know how we can engage with all those tax credit uh, customers so they do know that they're going to be switched across when they need to know. Um, actually, it can, you know, it can alarm people or frighten people unnecessarily uh, if you tell them something's going to happen in two or three years when their circumstances could have changed dramatically. So our focus is on getting the process right. When we get the process right, then we will try and model whether we think some people more, might fall out of that process, how many people might not be aware. And to be honest, we'll then try and fill that gap by improving the process design rather than accepting that some people will just miss out. We, we don't want anyone to miss out. OK, thank you. OK, can I just give a time check for the benefit of our witnesses as well as, 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 as MSPs? I think it's been quite a long session. We're done for another 20 minutes or so. Um, uh, and so far, I know our Deputy Convener wants to come back in as does Michelle Ballantyne. So um, anyone wanting to come in, catch my eye, time is, is gradually running out. Um, Polly McNeil. Um, just to quickly follow up on Alistair Allen, I, I have to say I think you're kidding yourselves if you think that people who are in current receipt of tax credit will not be alarmed. And I just put this to you for, for, for food for thought. The reason is... The, of a, a lot of the people in tax credits, and it has been a successful system, or maybe you don't think so, have not had any engagement with the benefit system at all and don't regard themselves as benefit receivers. So there's a fundamental change in the way that people are going to perceive now and the move to the DWP that they regard. And I have to say, I could sympathise with that because if you've been working hard for 30 years doing your best and getting a little bit of help from the state, and now you're told, oh, by the way, you're going to be treated as if you were unemployed and all your benefits, all your tax credits will be managed by, and you can't even tell this committee with any confidence how you're going to plan for that. I just I think that that's a serious concern to me. Um, I, I would like to put some figures to Donna, if you don't mind, Um so these are figures that the committee asked for from SPICE just to get some, I mean they are obviously um, selective figures and I'll let, let you have them but they take two key examples. So there's a net, a net household incomes after housing costs and childcare costs. The first example is of a lone parent with two children aged two and five in the national living wage. So average house costs, as I say, and no childcare costs. I will give you this. I mean, you don't have to answer it today. Um, but in the cases of someone who worked 12 hours and then 24 hours, and then examples of who worked 40 hours, in every single case, they are substantially worse off under universal credit by quite a bit. Um, then you take the second example that Spice have given as a couple with, with two children aged two and five in the national living wage. So that's a couple, not a, a single earner. Um, there is one case where they are slightly better off and in the other two cases, they're the same or lower. So the figures that we are being given don't bear out the evidence that you've given us this morning where there are, I mean, because that is a fair example, I think, of a family with two children, and they're worse off under universal credit. And what, what we've been hearing all morning is how, how successful it is. So uh, any response you want to give us would be helpful, but perhaps you might want to respond to the committee in time and I'll let you have the actual working. I was yeah. thought you would actually have 
those figures in the front of yeah. you, but Donna Ward, could you try uh, and address that? So um, there definitely are winners and losers. So uh, typically uh, families with children are likely to gain if they work relatively few hours. Um, I mean, the person on 12 hours, uh, they ought not to have qualified for tax credits at all. I mean, I'll obviously have to look at the example. So um, uh, they, th whereas they would qualify for universal credit. Um, and then it also depends whether people make use of the childcare offer and other things. So there are winners and losers because we're bringing in people into the uh, in-work benefit system even if they only work one or two hours, whereas the tax credit system was very much um, at particular points uh, on the earnings distribution. Um, so I'm not surprised there are some losers, uh, but there are also some gainers, and I'll be really happy to look at those figures. And just to reiterate, um we, are spend, we will be spending more on universal credit than on the legacy system. So on average, uh, people will gain. Some people, as you say, and the significant numbers of people will receive less than they would have done. Uh, we're happy to work through those cases and, and other cases to support you. I, I should go back on the point you made at the outset there about tax credit cases, and uh, we're not proposing to, to treat those people uh, as if they are someone who's not complying with their claimant commitment and is out of work, we're proposing to treat them with respect, um, help them, give them the support they need, automatically adjust their universal credit without any great need for them to, to contact us. We think it will be a smooth and easy system, and that's what we're looking to, to make sure is the case. So, so you know, I, I, don't, I don't think they need to be scared. Okay. Pauline. I'm happy to yeah. yeah, okay, Michelle Ballantyne. Okay, thank you. Um, just to follow up that, I, sh I should probably mention, because Pauline didn't, that the figures she gave were based on UC in 2016, so it takes no account of, of the budget changes and the changes that have been made over the last year and a half. Um, in terms of tax credits, um, can you confirm, well, I, I'm, I'm going to know it's the case, but actually you have to apply for your tax credits every year. So it, doesn't, it isn't just a rolling thing that continues. Um, and there is a, a period where you have to apply. And if you miss the deadline, it's not renewed and you have to start again. So, so in reality, the changeover will be just, just a different application. And actually, on the website for tax credits, it clearly states that that will be moving to universal credit. So people are being given notice every year at the moment um, as, they, as they reapply and as they come to apply. Um, so that information is there. But I just wanted to ask you a couple of things. Um, journals. Journals are a really important factor of universal credit. And um, there have been um, some complaints about journals not being answered. So, so people putting information onto their journals and then it not actually getting a, a quick response. Now, my understanding is that there should be a response within 48 hours of a journal being placed um, on there. So can you just sort of update the committee um, what issues you have, what has been done to resolve those, and, and you know what can we expect if we're asking the same question in six months or a year um, in terms of that performance around journals? Yes, yeah, so um, journals, you're right, form part of the way that we interact with customers now. We advise them to use their journal. Um, some of our customers do believe it's web chat. You know, there is a problem where, you know, if, and if somebody's got an urgent issue, then they tend to use the journal and then, and then pick up the phone, to be honest. So and we would want them to stay on the digital form if, format if we could. So at the moment, um, if I go back six months, I would have been saying to you, I had some concerns because we were just implementing and actually our resources were behind the curve, not in front. We're in front of the curve now. I was out in my service centres last week and every team are getting through their journals. Not on a Monday. Monday is a heavy lifting day because we're closed of a weekend, people use their journals over the weekend, and we also come back to a number of payments. So Mondays are a particular issue for us, which we're thinking about at a UK level of how we deal with that Monday load. Um, but the rest of the week, we should be getting to our journals. Now, that's in the case management system. Work coaches, again, it depends upon their... Um, at the point that they're in the rollout. The first three months after rollout, it's a transformation for them. It's, you know, we've talked about this is different for customers, different for them. They have to get used to managing their workload slightly differently. So I've got no doubt that, unfortunately, we probably might have missed a few along the way, 
But three months after that, after we've rolled, we're normally back on top of it. So I'd be concerned if you were finding any examples once we hit March of any significant issues. Because obviously we're still rolling out, you know, historical sites, you know, should be on top of it. But new sites might be having a little bit of a problem going through that, those early weeks. Monitor. I mean, are the statistics around that kind of waiting time, that 48-hour sort of response time? I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. the way we run the business is through team leaders and work coach team leaders. So we run it very much about the team leaders have got a, a, a set of 10 case managers. They are with them every day looking at what they're... They have a dashboard. So they have a dashboard. You've, you've seen a dashboard of information. They will look in on every single one of those dashboards and make sure that they're on top. If they're not then actually colleagues help around. So it's about active management, and that's the same with the work coach team leaders. OK, thank you. And the other question I just wanted to touch on was around um, the childcare element. Uh, again, the, there's been some concerns around having to pay the childcare up front, um, which can be quite significant if you've got a couple of children that are in, in childcare. Um, now, I know there's a process through the, the job centres, work coaches, et cetera, of, of cards uh, where they can, they can put their concerns or things that are worrying that you then pass through and look back. So I'm, I'm just wondering with the childcare, how much um, concern is coming through and is there anything in the pipeline around how we resolve some of that, that burden of upfront payment for people? It's partly a policy mm. and an operation yeah. question. Shall I start with a, with a policy? I, mean, I think the, the, in, a, in policy terms, my understanding, and I, I have to take this away to make absolutely sure, is that you know, actually, we can people pay people a month in advance of them actually moving into work because we recognise that people um, may have to, you know, set up childcare arrangements and um, and get children in in, in those childcare arrangements before they've actually started in in work. So there is that sort of uh, system in place. We've also uh, made improvements over the course of the last year or so, so that people can automatically upload. Uh, their childcare costs onto their account, um, so a much easier system than was the case uh, before. So I think that's the position from a policy perspective. And as as you probably know, it is more generous than the legacy system. So we pay up to eighty five percent of costs up to a limit, compared to seventy percent under tax credits. And I think it is a bit of a catch-22, which I will take away. I don't know how many Jira tickets have been raised. Sorry, these are the tickets that go up nationally. I will check. Um, but it is a bit of a catch-22, isn't it? Which is, we want verification, but actually, you know, some child care providers won't provide verification of cost until actually the cost is paid. So let me have another look at it and see what it's, it's telling us. Because yes, I think it is an issue for people. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we probably should touch on before we close the, the issue around uh, delayed payments in, in relation to the the five week wait, which is and I know there's been some changes. The five week wait in terms of the minimum wait that people uh, have to go through before they receive um, benefits and the information Trust or Trust gave out just recently in relation to they recognised there was a 15% increase in food bank usage, but a year after Universal Credit's been rolled out, there was a residual 52% overall increase in food bank usage, and there was concerns a lot of that was tied towards that minimum five-week delay, I think. This committee previously looked at Dumfries, where it was eight or nine weeks was the delays that were... That, that were that were uh, before I came onto the committee that, that was been experienced back in the day. Uh, now... There was commitments in the UK budget and by the Secretary of State in relation to those in legacy benefits when the transfer over. There's been a two-week follow-through of benefits being received, which in theory would lead to a, a three-week uh, delay in benefit. Was it, would that be an accurate description uh, of that well, particular announcement? I mean, if it, effectively what it would mean, I'm not sure what, what stage Job Seekers Allowance and Income Support are, are paid, but if we would be paying uh, people two weeks additional benefit in, say, Job Seekers Allowance. Um, my guess is that would that be paid in advance, Denise, or would that be paid? Job Seekers is paid in arrears. So, so effectively that would be paid, let's say, two weeks into that five weeks, and then there's another three-week wait before the first universal credit payment comes in, which is actually, I mean, I know, you know time is quite important for people on very low incomes, but... You know, they will be waiting another two weeks anyway for the next job seekers allowance. So they're used to waiting that sort of length of time. Um, but yes, that means that there is that effectively an interim payment 
of existing legacy benefits before the universal credit kicks in. Chin, what would be a five-week wait down to a three-week wait for those transferring from legacy benefits was my understanding of, of, of the, po- essentially of the correct, policy yeah. intent there. Not that, tax, not tax credits, I should, I should add, just right. to, so you're clear. Yeah. That's, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that wouldn't kick in until July 2020 is my understanding. So I'm just wondering, would you have some concerns in relation to that? Because obviously that's the right thing to do. It's an acknowledgement that things aren't working. That not kick into July 2020 means there's been people let down just now by that gap. It, I mean, it's additional. It's additional support. So we're keen to try and help smooth that process as much as possible. July 2020. I believe. I believe you're right in terms of that time scale. We want to do it as early as we possibly can, but you know you'll appreciate that it, it does take time to build up the system changes and, and other guidance and so on for, for work coaches to be able to do that. Um, in the interim, we do have uh, the changes we've already made, so we've still got 100% advances that people can get you know, pretty well from, from week one. Um, to go into that in a second, were, were you wrong-footed by that July 2020 announcement? Because if it was if it was a planned response to issues with the system, you guys have been good to go and just make that happen. So I, I, I don't think the the Chancellor and the Secretary of State made this change out of the largesse and kindness of the UK government. They did it in response to key pressures in relation to what what many sees flaws in the universal credit system. So I would hope that would be a planned change. And if it was a planned change, you guys could go on that now. And the fact that it's July 2020 means many folk will be let down by that. Would you recognise that as a reality? And I think, you know, the Scottish Government will face the same sort of challenges that any other government, the UK government, faces. You make a decision to make a change. It takes time to implement that, that change effectively. So, you know, the Scottish Government is taking understandably, a period of time to implement the, the policies it wants to bring in. You can't do these things overnight. Um, that is the, the duration of time it will take us to do it. Those would be planned changes, and I asked the question, were you cited on that? Were you a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, part of a planning process to make this happen? I'm just wondering, is July 2020 we, just plucked out of thin air, or what's the reality have, around well, that? I think, oh, sorry. I mean, we, have, we have been developing that policy for a period of time, but... You know, we haven't been developing it for two years. So, you know, we, we, we don't uh, decide something two years ago and then announce it two years later and, and roll it out the next day. We, we announce it relatively early in that development process and then we implement it. Donna, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I was just going to say it was one of the... Um, it, it was part of a, a package of things that our Secretary of State asked the Treasury for to ease the managed migration. Uh, so, yes, we recognise it's also an issue for new claims, but it was one of the things that we were specifically looking for to help ease managed migration, which is, you know, will be... Uh, therefore, uh, that timing kind of fits in with that. But obviously, if we could have had it earlier, that would have been even better. You know, if we could have had the money and delivered it earlier, that would have been even better, but we couldn't. So it's unfortunate that we're, 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 we can't accelerate that, that delivery. What about the point people would make if this protection is there for people on legacy benefits and it's not there for new claimants? Why would you have one group wait three weeks and another group wait a minimum of five weeks? There's a disparity and inequality there as well in relation to recourse to public funds. Would you recognise that? Different circumstances. So when you say new claims, I presume you'd be... You mean new claims from people who aren't currently on benefit? Uh, most of those people would be uh, coming out of work. So actually, most of those people will have a final payment from from work that can tide them over for a period of time. Most work, most payments are in arrears. So actually, their circumstances will generally be very different to the circumstances of people on legacy benefits. Hence, the different treatment. That obviously won't, won't be forever. I'm just trying to go through some of these because reference was made at the start, an opening statement to some of the changes in the budget. We haven't really re- referred to them just before we close this session. Uh, I, I understand that one of the issues I raised in the Universal Credit Debate last week was in relation to the the 12 months advance that, that people could get. Uh, we, we had information that people weren't always told they could get that advance and before they were told about it, they were told, could you borrow money off a of family or friends or anyone else before you got an advance. So is there a need to better better uh, train staff or clearer guidelines to staff so that people are made aware of their entitlement to an advance at the very point where they need that money rather than saying to them, well, you know, maybe your family members could get help you out here? Sorry, 
I'm sure you can be that all my staff understand what an advance is and also how to offer it. But you're right, the recourse to public funds as an advance, the first question is, have you got any other recourse to other funding first? But it's not some sort of interrogation, it's just a question. Once somebody says no, it's immediately into how to make an advance. Also, well, somebody... Sorry. So I, I apologise, but I know some of my constituents, and I, 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 I apologise for the discourtesy of interrupting you there, but I know some of my constituents will, who are just not not used to dealing with that system will, will, will go, oh, maybe um, I'll see what I can do, and that would be the end of that particular conversation, and off they would go. These people do exist, and that will happen for some vulnerable people, so I'm just not sure about that question at, at the start. Maybe that's something that has to be reconsidered. I, I mean, that is the training, and that's the guidance, and that's what's been agreed from a departmental point of view. So we're only following what we're being asked to do, and it's not unreasonable to ask somebody if actually they've got recourse to other funds. Um, what I would say is that it's also online. If somebody is digitally able, they can apply for it online now immediately, so they can fill in those boxes, they can say what they want and don't want to inform us about, but actually I think it's probably the most simplest system that I've come across in the 40 years that I've been a public servant, so you know, it is accessible to people, both digitally, by the phone or through work coaches. There might just be a disagreement on that, we're allowed to have that disagreement respectfully, that, 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 that's absolutely fine. The, 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 the 12 month payback period that we're referring to that's been extended to 16 months 18 yeah. 16 months. months yeah but that would so that's obviously an acknowledgement that when people get that advance um that the paying it back can be tough because it started off at a six month it had to be paid back over then it was 12 months it's now 16 months it does feel as if it's taken a while quite really taken a while to get right what a, a reasonable repayment period would look like but but that, that additional support doesn't kick in until October 2021. Why would that be? Uh, again, that's that's a question of how long it takes us to, to make the system changes. Um, I would say on that pattern of, of changes, the six months went up to 12 uh, because we were moving from 50% to 100%. So that was to keep the, the level of, uh, of, of repayments at the same sort of level 16 16 months is a further enhancement of the system it will take us a while to introduce yes i mean were, were you aware that that announcement was about to happen for the last few months was was that in the pipeline it's the same answer as as before yes we've been working on that uh, on that change for a number of weeks straight months um and uh, you know it's been announced and now we need to to implement it as, at the earliest possible opportunity Seem a pretty lengthy period of time to do something apparently as simple as to say pays that money back over 16 months rather than 12 months. So we've got people uh, having to wait to October 2021 to benefit from that. Do you think you could look again to bring that forward? I think for, for many people, most people, probably 12 months will still be the right period. You know, we don't necessarily want people having a lower income for, for too long. Um, we'll certainly go back and look at whether there's any way of bringing that in earlier, but my advice is. Actually, with all the other changes we've got to do, that's the earliest we can realistically do it. Well, that's helpful that you look at see if we can bring that in earlier. Can I just ask you, with the same consistency then, this would be really helpful, the July 2020 date to bring in that continuation of two weeks of legacy benefit, do you think you can look to accelerate that and bring that in sooner also? Uh, I think it's highly unlikely that would be possible because that's a, quite a significant change. Uh, to uh, you know, and actually, that's not that long a time frame to make a sort of change of that scale. So we're having to change a whole number of systems, the legacy systems as well as universal credit, to make that change. So uh, I wouldn't want to walk away from here leaving you with any expectation that it would be possible to accelerate that that time. Right. Um, okay. Without expectation, will you try? Sorry, would, would I try? Without any expectation, will you at least try? Well, I can go back and ask the question, but uh, I am very confident that when the Chancellor and the Secretary of State announced that timetable, they had thought long and hard about how quickly we could implement it, and that was the date they thought it was you know, the earliest possible sen sensible and safe date. So I sincerely doubt that there's any way 
me asking them would, would actually get them to change that. I might say diplomatically, the Chancellor and the Secretary of State have got fluctuating timetables in relation to the whole issue of universal credit and the rollout that seems to be a, a movable feast. But I'm conscious that I said the session was going to come to a close. I, sh I should point out that Shona Robinson, the MSP, has not been able to join us for much of this morning's session because of quite significant constituent issues in relation to the Michelin plant. Uh, where, where there could be a, a, a looming closure. Um, so I'm not going to finish just now. Shona, do you have any questions you want to ask just before we move on from this session? Thanks, Kavira. That would be really helpful. My apologies for having to, to, to leave uh, earlier. Uh, I did want to ask something which I understand has, hasn't been asked um, so far about the, the tax credit cases, um, where there's obviously been a, a delay in, in moving uh, them across. And it was two specific questions. One on... Because people on tax credits are going to have to uh, ap apply, so some of them won't know anything about this, that they're obviously dealing with HMRC, not the DWP, a lot of them will not know that this is coming. And the fact that, as I understand it, they will have to apply um, for uh, universal credit. Is there a, an assumption of an attrition rate there? That uh, Have you in your modelling assumed that there will be a certain percentage of, of those cases that don't apply for universal credit? We did get into this a little bit oh, earlier right, when you apologies. worked around it. I mean, my answer was um, we're working really hard uh, over the course of the next two years as we build up our plans around making those, those transitions from tax credits to universal mm -hmm. credit to make sure everyone does know, everyone knows what the process is, and if they do want to claim universal credit, and they don't have to, that's, that's a choice, but if they do that they do so so you know we're, we're planning for a zero percent attrition rate that's our that's our our determined uh, objective uh, as we move forward and as we get closer um you know we may think realistically a certain proportion of people will hopefully for choice rather than for um for any failure on our part not take up universal credit when they previously would have taken up tax credits we might then build that into our modeling but that's for much later in the process rather than something we do now. Right now, we want to plan for success. Are you writing to them to let them know this is happening? We'll write to them a number of months um, before they're due to transfer. So so the, the, the large-scale migration from tax credits to universal credit won't start until November 2020, and it will then carry on. Well, the migration as a whole will carry on for around three years. Um, so many months before that, before the individual is due to transfer, we will write to them, uh, we want to give them suitable notice, uh, but not so much notice that they've they've forgotten uh, by the time it gets there. I know one of the issues at the moment is the, the regulations are being looked at around transitional protection, and we have explored a little bit in the evidence uh, previously around uh, the need for those regulations to um, recognise particular circumstances and have a, an element of discretion. So, obviously, transitional protection would ex um, exist um, uh, to guarantee someone's income unless there's a change of circumstances. There's obviously concerns about what those change of circumstances may be. So, for example, someone fleeing domestic abuse, we wouldn't want them in a position of being concerned to do that if it was going to then income, impact on their income. So, uh, the regulations as they're being drafted, are those the kind of issues that are being looked at uh, around the, the drafting to make sure that there would be discretion in those kinds of cases? I mean, the regulations are now... Uh, they've been laid before the UK Parliament, so they were laid on, on Monday. Um, so they, those are the regulations. They will be debated, and we'll see what the UK Parliament makes of those. Um, it doesn't include that sort of provision. In those sorts of cases, someone's circumstances would have changed quite dramatically. Certainly, we wouldn't want to encourage uh, to do anything that would lead someone to stay in a relationship that, that they shouldn't stay in. Uh, I would hope that, that our, our processes wouldn't... Uh, deal with wouldn't cause that sort of problem what we talked about earlier on is the the, the fairly intensive support uh, and uh, and training that we give to our people to make sure they're alive to domestic abuse issues and they can help people uh, address those and connect them with people who are more expert to help them in the local community. I can understand the concern though here that you know if if the message is that a, a change of circumstance could disrupt your um, transitional protection arrangements I think it's really important that, that people are aware that they can have those types of discussions 
um, and that they're not making choices based on the worry about losing that. So could, would you undertake to take that back and make sure that whether it's in guidance or, you know, that there's clear, that, that claimants are clear that, you know, that if there are circumstances like that, that they have the right to, and that some, and that would be looked at sympathetically? I think communication around this is really important. Yeah, no, it is a very important issue. And I, I think I may have slightly misunderstood your, your question, because right? I was answering it in terms of people before they've been managed migrated, so before they've got transitional protection in place. Um, you know, actually, I will need to check this, but my understanding is that we have looked at that case of, you know, once people of uh, uh, a family unit have, have migrated across, transitional protection is in payment, then we will do things to try and make sure that that is in some way protected. If, uh, you know, generally a wife feels they have to leave because of domestic abuse, then that is something I believe that we have uh, addressed, but I do need to check that. To us with clarification yes. about that, please, because yes. that would be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. OK, um, that's us for this particular evidence session. It, it's been lengthy evidence session. We've covered a, a lot of ground and we're very appreciative uh, at the information you've given us if if you go away and you think oh, I want to clarify something we'd love you just to correspond with the committee and update us uh, I know Denise Horsfall kind of put you on the spot a little bit about uh, one one particular issue we haven't really explored some of the additional barriers in relation to people with English as a second language or learning disabilities or other disabilities and using the digital by default system and there are significant challenges there so anything you could provide in relation to that Problem. would would be very welcome but more generally just thank you for your openness and frankness uh, in helping us come gra grasp how we are going to um, draw our conclusions in relation to how social security uh, and, and what poverty relates to each other. So thank you all of you for your time this morning. And we now move to agenda item three. Thank you, which is in subordinate legislation. And the committee is invited to consider the Council Tax Reduction Scotland Amendment number three regulations 2018, which are subject to a, to a negative procedure. Can I refer members to paper three? A note by our clerk. The DPLR committee drew the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on the grounds of a drafting error which has been acknowledged by the Scottish Government and a correction will be made early in the new year. The DPLR committee also repeated their view that the instrument raised a devolution issue as highlighted previously with council tax reduction instruments. The committee's role is to consider the policy and the committee is invited to note the instrument. In noting, the committee may wish to support the DPLR committee's view that if the Scottish Government assesses that the, the drafting error could have, could have some unintended effects, it would be preferable to bring forward an amendment to correct the error promptly, given the provisions come into force on the 28th of November. Is the committee content to highlight the DPLR committee's view and note the instrument. Are we agreed to do that? Your silence and <laughs> your silent enthusiasm is noted for well, for the record. Consulted. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you. So um, as we agreed at agenda item one, we now move to agenda item four, which we've previously agreed to take in private. So we now move into private session. <laughs>